All right, good evening YouTube. In today's video, we are going to be reviewing part two of the best damn workout plan for natural lifters. So there's a couple things that I feel like I kind of brushed over in the last video, which I totally apologize for. The couple things that I do want to talk about here is kind of the relationship between volume, intensity, and frequency. Now, in any program in which, like if it's a high volume program, doing it with a lot of frequency, so frequency being how often you train the muscle and just how often you train in general, I'm not going to advocate anything in which two variables are high. Now, let's say we take a heavy light medium approach. Let's do it like a high medium low approach. So with volume, intensity, and frequency, if any one of these things are high, none of the other things should be. If you are doing low volume, then your frequency should be fairly high and you should be doing with um, moderate intensity. If you are doing high intensity, your frequency should be low and you should be doing it with moderate volumes or maybe um, moderate frequency and low volume. These are things that you can manipulate based on personal preference. Obviously, everyone's trying to optimize how they train and there are best practices for sure. But that's why in the programming series, I mentioned the most important thing is just being able to be consistent and apply effort over time. Now, consistency, one of the aspects of consistency is sustainability. If it's not something you can sustain, it's not something you can be consistent with. In the same way that if it's not something you can apply effort in week in, week out in, in every session, then it's not going to be something that is productive to your gains. So beyond optimization, beyond everything else that you are trying to focus on, you need to really think about consistency and effort. Be very mindful of those two things. Now, when it comes to this training program, um, this is part two of the video that I released previously. So I wanted to release that video and then release this video um, one after the other. So that way there's not a big ass gap between part one and part two. <clears throat> but anyway, all high level bodybuilders take performance enhancing drugs. Surprise, surprise there. That's uh, how this uh, article starts. So most people already know that. And the big problem is naturals copying the programs of enhanced lifters. So one thing I do want to kind of review is I know Chris Bumstead's um, workout program has become public very recently. And you know, like we've seen all the memes, the shorts, the TikToks, the, uh, I don't know, IG reels or something of that. Like those short clips in which everyone is taking off a shirt or a hoodie to reveal themselves in a tank top, calling it their pump cover and then playing a clip of Chris Bumstead. So yes, he's the... Arnold of our times, I guess you could say, because he's inspiring so many young people to start lifting. I wasn't born in that era, but I love the Terminator. I love Predator. Dylan, you son of a bitch. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that was a horrible impression. But anyway, like, seeing that physique made me want to work out. Seeing the Rocky movies made me want to work out. So, C-Bum is having that effect on people nowadays, and nothing's wrong with that. But... It's unfortunate that we are in a situation in which he can't be totally transparent or, and it's understandable. Um, and like, there's nothing wrong with that. What the wrong, there's nothing wrong with taking performance enhancing drugs because he is a competitive bodybuilder. He's trying to be the best in his sport. He's trying to dominate the sport. So there's nothing wrong there. The issues arise when someone lies about their PED use because then that gives really unrealistic uh, perceptions of what is possible for the natural lifter and what is to be expected, especially in their first year of training. And then when it comes to their workout programs, a lot of the things that they can get away with, we just can't. A lot of the ways that they train, like there's good principles there. I'm not saying that they're uneducated in their training. Like they're, they're not just going to the gym and fucking around and becoming um, Mr. Olympia. No, they have good training principles, but the thing is, it's specified for not only a completely different individual, it's specified for an individual with completely different circumstances. He is on performance enhancing drugs. That is a very, um, that changes a lot of things. You are literally injecting tonnage, so sets, reps, and you know exercise selection even, or the number of exercises you do into your muscles. That's why you can inject yourself with performance enhancing drugs and become more muscular and lose fat without training. So that's why the training principles should be a bit different because they're not the same. Um, like you're not the same person and then furthermore, you're just not in the same circumstance, which is why he advocates that you train each muscle with high frequency. As a natural lifter, the training session itself is the trigger that initiates protein synthesis or muscle building. And the rate of protein synthesis stays elevated for 18 to 36 hours post-workout depending on the nature of the workout. So here's kind of like 
One thing I will say is that a strength workout and let's say a more volume based workout will fatigue you in completely different ways and especially the muscle. I find that when it comes to strength workouts, um, I am more like, let's say systemically fatigued. So like I'm just more tired, like the pain isn't or not the pain, but the soreness is not just local to one area or one muscle. But if it is a more volume based workout, that muscle is just, you know, fried the next day, can't really put much um, effort through it. So it's just better to just rest that muscle. So the minimum frequency for hitting a muscle for significant gains is twice per week, but three days per week would be better. So one thing that I do want to point out is when this article was written, and that was in 2018. Now, I don't know exactly when the Brad Schoenfeld, um, the Brad Schoenfeld study came out that kind of reinvigorated life into the bro split or the body part split. And yes, a body part split can be beneficial if volume is, you know, volume is equal. But as I mentioned in the previous video, chances are volume is not going to be equal. And also another thing, effort will not be equal across the sets if they're done all in one session versus multiple. And also, like, I don't know about you guys, but this is just a personal thing. I find a bro split to be boring as all fuck. Like, I just really do. Like, I to just get a full pump in one muscle, like, is not really, like, just, just one muscle is not really that fun for me, me personally. But anyway, so one thing I do like about this kind of uh, method of a workout program is that he emphasizes maximizing the intensiveness of the work sets. So getting the most out of every set. Now, this is something that you'll hear on like Steve Shaw's Massive Iron channel, Fast Lifts, um, even other like more like with a lot of trainers and coaches who have a background in strength first, getting the most out of every set seems to be a common theme among them. Uh, at least that's what I've noticed and for good reason it works you don't need to do this uh, super high volume like five to eight sets per exercise or I know eight is very rare but I've seen weird things or like in a single workout 10 plus sets for a single muscle group you don't need to be doing that you just need to be doing maybe uh, maybe six to eight sets per like for, uh, for a single muscle in one workout and that's kind of like pushing it even but just getting the most out of every set uh, when the volume when the whole volume and you know do more volume to get more muscle there is an argument to be made that because humans are adaptive uh creatures the more you do something the better you're going to get at it and that's just sra right stimulus um recovery and adaptation cycles so you provide a stimulus you're you dip below baseline and when you recover you enter the super super compensatory stage in which you recover above the baseline and then you are now stronger, bigger, whatever, and that is your adaptation. Now, as an adaptive um, organism, we will adapt to whatever we throw at the body. Now, with that being said, that doesn't just mean do all the volume, do all the intensity, do all the reps, do all the sets, because there is such a thing as under recovering or over being overworked, overtraining. So that is possible too. And when you're a natural, it's even more possible because one thing that performance enhancing drugs do is that it does give you better recovery to handle more training sessions. Not only are you injecting yourself with tonnage, you are injecting yourself with, for lack of better words, performance enhancing drugs. You're able to get more out of each set and you're able to perform more sets, train more frequently and go from there. So there is a lot to kind of uh, think about. And when you are a natural lifter, you should just focus on high quality safe sets with a lot of the stuff that came out with the muscle protein synthesis thing like it becomes very easy to forget consistency and effort effort is a thing that should never leave your program volume is not a, repl a replacement for effort and neither is intensity because intensity needs volume intensity needs to be in your program you can't just push every single set to failure sometimes you want to train Slightly further from failure, but with a heavier weight, so that way it's still effective and go from there. So let's see. Includes three types of muscle stimulation, so not all muscle contractions are created equal. Some methods work by having greater impact on mTOR activation, so accentuating the eccentric, um, and then that pause. Others by creating a greater amount of muscle damage, and others by increasing the rate of local growth factors. So to maximize growth to all patterns, uh, to, to maximize growth, 
you'll target all the growth pathways with several different methods. So it's looking very similar to what it was before, the modified push-pull splits. And I do like this split. I think it's a great way to do what he's talking about, hitting everything three to four times a week. But you can also do this with a full body. Like uh, if the goal here is just frequency, a three or four times per week full body training can accomplish this also. And it's um, you're able to do that every other day. And then maybe with, uh, so if you do three days, right? You do every other day and then um, you rest on the weekends and repeat that week in, week out. For most people with busy lifestyles, that is going to be great. As long as just do like anywhere between like uh, three to four sets per muscle per workout and you're golden. Do that three times a week, you're golden. This is why when it comes to most splits, I actually, my bias, right? My, because like I will always include some element of strength training because I really do think that most people do want to have some mix of strength and size and also strength and size feed into one another. When it comes to programming, I think the best splits are the full body and the upper lower. This is not to say that hybrid programs like an upper lower push pull legs or a five day um, gentleman split or a push pull leg are ineffective. They are very effective ways of building muscle. But when you add the variable of strength and size together, the push-pull legs and even like a five-day split becomes kind of tricky because one thing we know about strength is that it's very neurological and recovery is more than just the muscles. It's also your nervous system. But with a modified push-pull split, this is going to be great for building muscle because this is a muscle building program. And with the program that I put out last time, in addition with it, it did have an element to strength to it, which is why I had to implement a heavy light medium setup within the push-pull. Um, but that's available on the other uh video so let's go into that next so you'll be training with different methods so heavy lifting um you'll be using two options so stick so two options so rest pause and cluster sets so cluster sets are great however the thing is with a lot of these uh, methods they're just tools and like to a hammer everything or yeah to a hammer, everything is a nail. Now, the thing is, if in like in the article itself, it says like, you know, different muscles and different methods, like must different muscle contractions are not created equal. So that's why it's important to incorporate these things. But if you look at the literature, there are some research that does show that whether you do drop sets, res pause, and all these other um, training methods, that when volume is created, when effort is um um, equal or not created uh, but equal and you are like pushing so close to failure and volume is equated then it really doesn't really all that matter that much now that's why like if like when volume is equated is a very important caveat because if you were to implement this you need to kind of think to yourself if i'm doing cluster sets right so it's like one rep rest, rest 15 seconds one rep rest 15 seconds so find a way that you can live for two to four reps. Do as many sets of one rep as possible with 15 to 20 seconds each rep. Stop when you know that the next rep will feel iffy. It might look like this. So this is one, two, three, four, five. This is five reps, right? Real, would this really have been all that much better than just actually using a weight that you could just do for five reps and you'll be one rep shy of failure with five reps? Would, that, would this really be all that much better than that? an argument could be made now this is and also like what movement are you using this on is this for the bench press is this for the squat because if you were to do this on the bench press i would personally say you're wasting your time and you would just get more out of just going straight to do five reps if this is for the deadlift it's a completely different story for the deadlift i think clusters work incredibly well because one thing a lot of people fail to do is they fail to reset between their deadlift reps and then their form suffers so that is horrible. But the thing is, just saying that, you know, not all muscle contractions are created equal and then just alternate for the heavy lifting, alternate between these two things. Yes, it'll work because a lot of things work. That's, that's one thing that's really important to understand about training. A lot of things work, but you need to find what works for you. And what works for you isn't just, does it give you results? It's also, do you enjoy it? Do you actually enjoy your training? Do you find this way of training to be like mentally and physically stimulating? And do you find like um, pleasure progressing in this way? Because 
with some of my clients, I've talked to them and they said, hey, I actually don't like this. And I'll tell them, oh, yeah, cool, you don't have to do it. And they're just kind of like, oh, really? And I was like, yeah, but if in at the cost of you not doing that, let's do this instead and give that a try, see if you like it. And if they like it, cool, if they don't, there's other things that we can implement and other ways we can get around it. And obviously if, they, if it's like said, for example, I want a strong squat, but I hate squatting, okay? There's a couple of things I have to ask there. Why do you want a strong squat? Why do you not like squatting? And then like we'll go back both, both We'll go down both directions. Well, I want a bigger squat because I'm a power lifter and I'm, I'm going to compete. I was like, well, we can't just remove squatting from your the equation, but we can maybe include something like more like a conjugate system and then go from there, right? Or it's, uh, let's say, well, I just want bigger legs like, and I hate squatting. Okay, cool. We don't need to use the barbell back squat, but we should use some type of squat motion. Maybe like a hack squat, a Smith machine squat, a leg, and then of course the leg press. Um, so there's other options that we can do depending on the goal, right? So that's kind of like a rant on like the necessity of these kinds of methods because yes, they work, but you should be mindful of when you implement them. So I do like rest pause sets, but I do think that they are just better for going beyond failure. And I do believe that's how it's used um, in the part two. Next is mTOR activation and mTOR like, you know, uh, let's see. So you'll use a nice torture method called post fatigue loaded stretching, which is nothing wrong with that. You pick a weight you can do 8 to 10 reps with using a slow negative, lowering under control for 4 to 5 seconds. Now, this will introduce a very interesting topic of tempo work. I don't think tempo work is anything too magical. As long as you're controlling the weight and not being a jackass with it and pausing at a reasonable inter um, interval, there's really you're not really getting anything out of doing 4 to 5 second controlled reps because you pick a weight you can do 8 to 10 reps using a slow negative. So if I were to say... You pick a weight you can do eight to 10 reps. Let's say that's on your bench press and you can do that with 225. And now I add that stipulation, lowering under control for four to five seconds. Maybe now it's 205 or 185 if we wanna be a bit more extreme with the example, right? And let's say you're doing eight to 10 reps. So if you do 10 reps with 225 when you could have been doing 10 reps with 225, you just removed, um, 200 pounds of tonnage and for what just because you control the weight longer for 45 seconds that makes up for it it's a useful tool it has its place and i'm not saying never do it but using it as like let's say one of the ways that you rely on let's say progression or something of that nature i do think that there's an argument to be made that it is somewhat unnecessary so let's look at the split so same thing as last time push pull so quads, pecs, delts, triceps, pull day, hamstrings, lats, rhomboids, and rear delts, and biceps. Let's look at the lifts. For these recommendations are personal preferences, so you can make changes as long as it maintains the spirit of the plan. Don't replace a back squat with a single leg extension. So very good there. So I've never heard of a lumberjack squat, so let me look that up real quick. That's an actual lumberjack. Okay, so it's a landmine squat. I really... Uh, okay, cool. So lumberjack squat, goblet squat, or lumberjack squat. And then mile reps, so let's see. Um, so if I'm understanding this correctly, okay, so these are the movements. Yep, so these are just the movements. They're not actually like laying out like what you're going to be doing in one workout. So front squats or zercher squat. So zerchers were really popular in 2018 because like, you know, like it's it was like one of those, like the lift you never heard of before or the lift prisoners used to get jacked because they don't have a barbell rack or squat rack or something of that nature, right? So like that lift became very popular. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad lift, but you know, make sure that it's comfortable on your elbows and make sure that you're actually getting something out of it. Now, um, you know, there's an argument to be made that it's not the best for hypertrophy. So keep that in mind. Next is goblet squats and lumberjack squats. These are great movements, front loaded movements. One thing I would be concerned about is just the fact that if you're using your front squat as your main heavy movement, I think that doing a goblet squat and then a lumberjack squat afterwards you know me personally i would want to hit things in a bit different way so i would do like a high high bar squat a wide stance box squat post stance box squat pin squat something else a, a different heavy movement maybe like um load it on your back rather in front of you and go from there uh then leg extensions for myo reps that's cool bench press or incline bench press mtor dumbbell flat bench or dumbbell inclines that's cool myo reps machine pack deck or machine chest press so no issues with the exercise selection there 
military press or smith machine shoulder press so if you are using the smith machine shoulder press be mindful if your smith machine is the kind that goes straight up and down or the kind that um goes at an angle so uh just be mindful of that so that way you know which way you should set up let's see lateral raise on an inclined bench not horrible lateral raise or machine shoulder press so cool heavy close grip bench press so one thing i think is always interesting is that whenever you include the close grip bench press you shouldn't like yes it's more tricep focused but to think of it as solely a tricep exercise is not really the smartest so you have to think about there's a couple things you need to be thinking about if you do a heavy close grip bench press right how is it going to affect your chest recovery how is it going to affect your bench press recovery how is it going to affect your joints when you reg do your regular bench press is that going to be is introducing the close grip bench going to be a factor that you need to contend with because it's a heavy tricep movement so let's say you were doing this in like a powerlifting program right let's say you do you bench like your competition bench twice a week like i, I remember reviewing like like um, basic program splits and like a power the most basic powerlifting sp split is bench squat bench deadlift and let's say on one of those bench days you do your regular bench and then follow with it with close grip bench press either at the end of the session or right after that is going to skew your numbers as far as like volume goes and it might mess with your recovery and it might be a bit much for your elbows to recover from so be mindful that of that when you do include it within your program and really monitor that Heavy Romanian deadlifts. So Romanian deadlifts can be done heavy. Um, nothing wrong with that. Just be, your form has to be perfect. That's the thing. Like you're not, you don't get the chance to reset. So every single rep has to be perfect. So progression should be slow. Dumbbell Romanian deadlift uh, with front of feet elevated one inch. So like putting a plate underneath you. And then leg curls for my reps. Um, I mean, me personally, stiff leg deadlifts or even deficit deadlifts that's what i would put here but that, that's also because i do bias those like pulls from the floor but for a muscle building program i do understand why you would put the remaining deadlift now for mtor i would think that maybe something like a back extension could work but that's just uh, coming off the top of the top of my head um but let's move forward neutral grip pull up or lat pull down build up to do pull-ups i don't care who you are build up to do pull-ups like unless you have something wrong wrong with the shoulder if um, with the exception of true blue injuries do fucking pull-ups man like god damn it I, I i really don't know where i got this stat from and i need to double check it because i've been like talking about it um to a lot of my in-person clients but i'm pretty sure like 70 percent of all men in the world cannot do five pull-ups so level up level up uh straight on pull down i do like that i would honestly prefer a more of a pullover but that's just me i've started to love that exercise uh rhomboid seal row penalty row biceps okay weekly program six days a week front squat or searcher squat two to three warm-up sets for four to six reps then one work set of rest pause for or cluster so this is kind of the one hard set mentality and with this yes you are getting the most out of one set and the warm-up sets or the feeder sets for four to six reps, they're not doing nothing. Like, they are providing you volume. They are providing you quality tonnage. But, like I said, for the amount of fatigue that you are going to be accumulating as a result of implementing these intensiveness techniques, because these are high-intensiveness techniques, is it really worth it for the strength and size gains? And that is something for you to decide and test out for yourself. Like, if you can put less I, i'm this is a very dangerous wording but if you can if you can put less effort into something and get the same amount of results you are better off doing that because now you have more energy to do to apply effort somewhere else so um i hope that was a <laughs> responsible recommendation now like i said rest pause and clusters they work but um like i said these are high intensity high intensiveness techniques and they could make things a bit more tricky a bit more difficult so what i would definitely recommend is implement these sparingly implement these every now and then to keep training spicy but to have your program actually based upon it is not my ideal just because progress will become harder to manage progress will be harder to measure so it's worth noting that if you rely on these intensive next techniques to just do one hard set it might become a bit more difficult to track progress over time now Progress is not a replacement for effort. You should still always be training close to failure, but 
The thing is, if you are just doing regular sets, training closer to failure rather than, let's say, rest pause or um, clusters, you might actually get more reps. And if we know that there is a uh, dose relationship between uh, volume and muscle growth, that would benefit you. So close grip bench or floor press and then rest pause or cluster. So heavy squat, heavy tricep work, dumbbell flat press. press. Um, so muscle building for the chest and then dumbbell lateral raise or shoulder press. So good. 10 to 12 reps um, and then one set of 10 to 10 failure, then micro sets of three reps as possible. So um, that's, I always forget the terminology for this stuff like the mTOR and yeah, all that kind of stuff. So just, you know, pushing to failure. And then, so nothing too egregious there, but like I said, the program relies so heavily on the intensiveness of each set that this is one application of, you know, getting the most out of every set, but it's not the only application and it's not even, I would argue, the standard way of doing it. Most of the time, it's just giving yourself a range, right? So let's say I'm doing three sets of eight to 12. If I can hit 12 or if I can hit more than 12 easily, it's too light. If I can hit at least eight, it's too heavy. And then every single set, I push as hard as I possibly can. And then let's say on set one, I hit 12. On set two, I hit 11. On set three, I hit eight. You hit, you push yourself as hard as you could each, every single time. You're one rep shy of failure per set. You got the most out of every set. And that is a total of 12, uh, 23, 31 reps. Now with this, let's see, you do two to three warm up sets of... So at most, you're going to do 18 and then a bunch of ones. Or like if you do the clusters at least, or maybe like, uh, so it'll be a lot harder to make up for that volume. That's, that's the point I'm trying to illustrate here. Now, obviously, training is more than math, but, uh, and I'm horrible at math anyway. Like I, you can tell like how like, hard it is for me to just calculate um, simple math. So you're seeing, like you're seeing numbers just like crashing in my head because I suck at math, but anyway. That's uh, one issue when it comes to just these intensiveness techniques rather than, you know, giving effort per set and just kind of being a bit more like, you know, conventional in your approach. So remaining deadlift, I like that as a way to start the movement or deadlift clusters from pins. That's good. And it does start at mid shin, which is below the knee, which is good. Um, so with the Romanians, me personally, like four to six is a pretty low range. I kind of think six to eight is where I would put it at the lowest. Because I do think Romanians are something that you should stick to fairly high reps just because, like I said, form needs to be crisp, uh, crisp and pristine. So there's a couple things that you can do. Do low reps for really good form, or if you, but if you do higher reps, you need to lighten the load, really control it, and go from there. Uh, dumbbell pullover, I like that movement. Uh, rear delt machine, and then standing barbell curl. So the exercise selection is good. The sets and reps are good, but the thing is, like, they're pretty much standard for everything. And I'm not against low rep barbell curls because, you know, the curl is like a very unique movement and it can be loaded heavy. Uh, just be mindful to not, like, it's not a power movement. So, like, be very mindful with it. Be very strict with it. Go as heavy as you can with strict form within this rep range. Military press or Smith Machine shoulder press. So, it's the same thing as, like, all the other heavy work. Like, they all follow the same uh, template. Um, goblet squat or lumberjack squat. 8 to 10 reps was still eccentric. So, you know, tempo, like tempo stuff. Like, is this really more beneficial than regular sets? Like, uh, I know we, you know, we bash on things like missionary. We bash on things like just what's normal. And we kind of, like, we like an underdog. And, you know, it's within our nature to hate winners. But the thing is, we found something that works really well. Now, it's not perfect. And there are definitely things that we can implement that might like stoke the fire, you know, get things back on track and spice up training, like I mentioned earlier. But that doesn't mean it should become the whole training program. So nothing wrong here. Overhead, single tricep extension, and then machine pec deck and machine chest press. So nothing wrong there. Um, and you are getting a good amount of volume. I mean, like with the warm up sets, like I said, it's not nothing. So two to three sets of 46 reps, that's pretty good. Followed by one more set. So you're getting three to four hard sets, you know? And that's really what I recommend for each training session. And then all the pull days. So it's very similar to the other training day and I don't think we need to go over everything else just because 
The exercise selection is fine. The exercise selection, there's nothing really wrong with it. And the way that it's ordered is pretty good. You're always starting out with a heavy movement. You're never, you're never doing leg extensions and then like going into something heavy. Like you're never doing something like that. Now, like, you know, pull-ups for strength work. There's, I, I do have my issues with that, but it's not that big of a deal because like at the end of the day, this is the heaviest movement of the day. So that's, it's, that's worth noting. But anyway, the exercise selection is good. But like I said, because of its reliance on intensiveness techniques, yes, you're getting the most out of every set. Yes, this is one way to allow you to work around low volume. So if you literally want to go into the gym and just do four exercises, you go in, go out, 45 minute adventure, um, quick, like uh, easy, and not have a mental breakdown at the end of it, then this is an option. Like it's definitely a viable option and it's a good option. But like I said, the to kind of proclaim it as the best damn workout plan for natural lifters is kind of disingenuous because there's other ways to train that accomplish everything that this program aims to do. There are other program splits that also accommodate a lot of the things that he mentions, the need for frequency, the need to have lower volume uh, workouts. These can all be accomplished with workout plans and workout programs that are not this one. So it's maybe I'm just being semantic about it, but it's a good program. It's definitely something that I feel like we can learn a lot from, but to take it as written, and just implemented it implement it just like that i think that could be a little dangerous so when it comes to this program and this kind of information there's a lot that you can learn from and there's a lot that you can like you know take and implement and use on certain exercises and others because one thing's for sure you shouldn't train your deadlift the same way you train your bench you shouldn't train your squat the same way you train your lateral raise so um just having these muscle contraction methods in there. It seems somewhat arbitrary to me. Now there's always the possibility that I'm just uneducated. This guy is Christian Thibodeau. So he has been training pro bodybuilders and a lot more athletes than I have. He has a lot more experience than I have. He has, he's definitely more like more well read and like better kept up on the literature than I am. Now, with that being said, the, intent of this channel and what i try to do is try to be as pragmatic as possible to try to be as um to try to provide information that is as useful as possible now if there's ever something that i just don't fully understand i'm going to look into it more and of course experiment with it more but what i have found in the people that i've coached and i mean i've only coached so many people who have more athletic based goals so compete competition goals um but when it comes to a lot of my clients and those who are like actual athletes these methods don't make up the bulk of their programming and yet they're still able to get a lot stronger. One of my clients actually just surpassed me on the squat, which, you know, it's kind of like, I don't want to blame. I never want to blame like my knee injuries or whatever. And so like the thing is like whenever I hear someone like, you know, getting close to my squat numbers or surpassing it, then I would really, <laughs> I really just forget that I have a knee injury and forget that I actually dislike the squat and try to uh, get as strong as I can on it in the shortest amount of time. Like that's something that I do have to deal with in my own ego and I do work through it and I just like, you know, like just relax about it, relax, um, tone it down a bit and just make sure and just stick to the path. But yeah, like one of my clients just surpassed me on the squat. So it's like actually really good to see, really proud of him for that. So good job to him. Um, but yeah, but we didn't use a majority of these methods. Like I would say almost 99% of them. The only thing that we kind of implemented sort of was just cluster sets for the deadlift just because i want really wanted to like tighten up his form um mtor activation so like uh like the tempo stuff and the pause stuff it has its place don't get me wrong but the thing is like to use it as a default method i would never advocate that um let's see if there's anything else that i should mention in this program so what if i can't change uh six days a week so oh shoot he actually has other ways to train so here's the thing the workout lasts around 30 minutes so here's the thing that like is worth noting if you're not in a situation in which the gym is literally 10 minutes away this 30 45 minute workout might become a two hour endeavor the gym might be 20 30 minutes away it takes you 20 30 minutes to get your shoes on to get ready for the gym and then like the like 20 30 minutes commute like uh back and forth like i said 
as of now a two hour endeavor. So it should be possible to fit them into your schedule. Yes, the workout by itself, 30 to 45 minutes, but the whole process, you know, that could be a lot to ask for for a busy individual. So this is his answer. So let's see, it's a five day split. So push one, pull two, push, pull, push. So it's kind of taking like inspiration from like a, uh, a B split because you know, not every workout is hit every single time you go into the gym and you know, it works. But at the same time, it works. Like, it's very asynchronistic, but it works. I can't really complain too much about that because I could become all pissy and be like, oh, you're not pulling um, equally on some weeks. But the thing is, you balance it out next week because you're not pushing as much as you are pulling on the other weeks. But, you know, that's that's just something in my brain because I do think you should pull often, um, like back work often. So four days a week. So same thing, like one and two and then three and one and then Let's see. Does that mean on week three you would do two and three and just go back to one and two? I mean, he doesn't say so. I mean, I guess you're just doing push one and pull one back like the next week, right? But maybe not. This program is not for you if you're training less than four days a week. Um, why not? I mean, I don't really see anything like the, the so here. The reason why you can't do this three days a week is because of all the goddamn intensiveness techniques. <laughs> Like there's nothing wrong with intensiveness techniques for you to do four exercises and actually get a good ass workout. You need them. But so I uh, probably should have been a bit more clear on that. But like, let's say in a regular training program in which most of you are probably going to write for yourselves or try to incorporate these ideas on, you wouldn't take this template, apply it to an existing workout and then add all these intensiveness techniques and expect it to work. You just wouldn't now. So that's why like, if it is like a four day split, or a three-day split, you would just have to simplify it, turn it into very, um, very normal stuff, and just do basically a full body split. Um, make things a bit more cohesive, superset things a little bit, and then do things for three to six, um, like two to four sets for six to twelve reps. You know, somewhere within that range. And then now you're able to do this three days a week. So if you do want to do this, one thing I would just say is like, don't use all the intensiveness techniques. Use them on some movements and not others. If you are doing less sets. So for example, if I'm doing something like, if I do two, if I program for a client, I want you to do two sets of 10 to 15. Then I'm going to include a intensiveness technique on that second set, at, at the end of that second set, after they hit 15 on that second set, then they'll do an intensiveness technique. So that's kind of how I use these methods rather than as like, use it for literally everything. I just don't think it's um, productive for that. Let's see, what about cardio? Uh, of course, what type adds for you? So. Some people will do better on a lactic, so now no lactic acid produced. Sprints with immediate maximum effort lasting 9 to 12 seconds, followed by 60 to 90 seconds of rest or active rest. Others do better with uh, lactic work, so steady state stuff. So do the type of cardio that's most appealing to you. That's honestly the best advice that we can think of. Um, now, I think when it comes to cardio, we, a lot of us get too strung up on like, oh, it's going to eat into my muscle. It's going to eat into my strength. Chances are it's not. And if it does, you can stop it. Do something else and figure out what kind of cardio doesn't eat your strength and go from there like it's kind of like saying like the thing is like it's, it's a i think it's like called a fallacy of composition where we take an attribute of let's say a part right and we apply that attribute to the whole so let's say we have a wall right so this brick is three pounds and this wall is made of bricks therefore the wall is made of three pounds Let's say we do that in reverse with cardio. Cardio kills my gains or cardio kills my gains. Um, doing the Stairmaster is cardio. Doing the Stairmaster will kill my gains. That is a horrible line of logic because doing the Stairmaster is very different than let's say doing like running five miles, running for 60 minutes, jogging and like all this other high impact kind of stuff, sprinting and stuff of that nature. You need to find what works for you because applying what might work or one part of something does not really define the entire whole. So cardio is something you should incorporate. It'll keep you healthy. The heart is kind of important, guys. So let's keep that in there. A word on fat loss. All right, let me listen to this real quick. <laughs> so this program is actually a good approach even without cardio when you're trying to lean down. Uh, so a big mistake people make when dieting is to do a lot of volume. Yes, when you're cutting, I actually advocate that you do a more strength-focused way of training. Simply because 
If you're able to maintain your strength, you are more likely maintaining your size. Strength training is a great way to maintain size on a cut, in my opinion. The next thing is the fact that if you are dieting, I'll also add that you often try to add so much volume, but here's the thing. When you are trying to recover from a very high volume workout, what do you need a lot of? Calories. What are you not getting a lot of in a cut? Calories. So it doesn't really make sense to just cut a bunch of volume. So for me personally, like I would just focus on trying to maintain as much strength as possible because if you do that, you're going to end up building muscle or even maintaining muscle, which is both what you really want. Uh, let's see. So high, very high cortisol release, which is very difficult when you're trying to lose fat. So you need to consume as food. This gives you less energy, which means that you are not going to be able to handle a lot of volume. So how do you get the most out of low volume? You do high intensity. That's why I mentioned earlier. Um, there's like the trifecta or the, well, what was the word I used? I don't think, whatever. So there's volume, intensity, and frequency. If you are on a diet, you probably can't do all that much on volume. You want to be as intense as you possibly can be. And you want to be as frequent as your recovery allows. So let's let's think of it like that, right? We can make a whole video topic separate from that. So with this approach, you prevent excess cortisol rele release. So cortisol is something that he mentions a lot because it is something to think uh, to think about. But I do think it's one of those things where you don't need to be consciously aware of, oh shit, is my cortisol too high or something of that nature. Like I feel like at the extremes, yes, it might become worth thinking about. But if you're just the average guy, we can think about other things that might be a bit more important to think about. Are you consistent enough in your training? Are you doing enough effort in your training? Are you recovering from the amount of volume that you're currently doing? Is the amount of volume you're currently doing actually providing you benefit? And if it's not, we can adjust there. And then, of course, like what's your calories like? Are you consistent with your calories? Are you consistent with your sleep? There's all these other things that we can talk about, all these other things that we can like measure before we can do something like, well, man, like the only thing left to do is like measure that cortisol. That's all we can do. Like, there's so many things before that point. So expectations. This system has proven time and time again how effective it is for natural trainees who have average or below average genetics, but it only works if you're capable of the level of effort required to make the system work. So it only works if you're capable of the level of effort required to make the system work. So here is kind of the first argument that kind of like comes into the head, right? This, for one, this statement can be applied to any system, right? Because like there's probably a amount of effort that can be applied to any system that will make it work really, really well. But then is that amount of effort feasible for you? Is that amount of effort sustainable for you? And does that amount of effort required to make the system work fit with your consistency? So if it doesn't, this is not a good program for you. This is why I mentioned consistency and effort are the two variables that you have to be the most mindful of with any program. So it only works if you're capable of the effort required to make the system work. So let's, let's look at things. If you are, you know, let's say you're like the ability, like let's say your effort, right? Like your best effort is, might not be the amount of effort needed to make the system work. So you need to find a system that will reward the best level of effort that you're able to provide at that moment. That is why I really advocate the idea of starting where you stand, like do what you can in the current moment, not what is best on science, what is best in paper, do what's best for you right now. And then that might change. So what you have to do, you have to start where you stand again, because you're standing somewhere new, you're standing somewhere different. So start where you stand. So uh, for something to, for it to say, it only works if you're capable of the level of effort required to make the system work. This applies to every um, system. And let's say the system does not reward your effort. Find a different system, not a better system, but a different system because that system is better for you. So this is not to um, rag on the, the program itself because it's a good program. But there are things that I think that are wrong with it. The limited number of work sets means that you must take each work set to the limit. If you do not, if you don't, you won't reap the benefits. But those who will always report gains way above their expectations. So here's kind of where I say something like, that's true. That should be expected because, you know, the harder you train, the better results you typically get. So what if you just did three sets going reasonably close to failure, maybe one to two reps shy of failure per set, 
and the number of reps you hit per set might be a little different because you know you're training one to two sets shy of failure would that not result in very similar gains i would argue it would and it would be you know less stressful in my um estimation so this program it i it, it gets a like don't get me wrong like <laughs> let me actually like it so to support the boy uh support the mans the guy the dude but it's something in which you take you learn from you get inspiration from you change you modify and you make better for you so it's it's you know to take a very bruce lee kind of approach to any of these program reviews that we do but this one definitely but yeah christian thibodeau very smart guy i do he has a youtube channel and like it's kind of criminal how underrated he is so um if for whatever reason you somehow managed to find my channel before you found anything produced by him because he's been writing and producing videos for quite a while but it's kind of uh inconsistent just because you know he is incentivized by his views and like because there are bigger channels out there that bigger channels aren't a substitute for better knowledge and he is one of the most knowledgeable coaches out there so follow him on instagram follow me on instagram at stand strength or you can follow my personal instagram as well um and then please like comment and subscribe if you found the information useful my name is Curls the king standstrength.com Thank you so much for watching. And if you like this video, there will be many more next video coming out this Saturday. And you can always check out my website for merch. We do have student and military and veteran discounts. So if you are interested in the merch, just check it out on my website. It would really mean a lot to me. That is one of the ways that I want to, you know, get a profit from the content that I produce simply because for one, I wanted to make workout clothes that, you know, actually looks kind of cool. So I wanted to wear like, gym because the thing is like i wanted to produce gym clothes that don't look like gym clothes and actually just look like a regular like streetwear kind of stuff because oftentimes either they just copy high, um, high fashion or fast fashion or like um they're just too sporty and too loud and you know skaters have their thing and every other niche has their kind of thing and has their kind of fashion but i feel like the lifter we need to look good in and out of the gym with a shirt without a shirt and in a cool shirt so if you are interested in that, just please check out my website. See if there's anything on there that you like. And like I said, there are discount codes for uh, military and uh, students. So military and fire, police, and all that use code HERO. And if you are a student, I believe for the uh, apparel discount, it's code SCHOLAR. So if you're a student, I hope that you are a student and can actually spell that. <laughs> but hopefully no one uh, takes advantage of that. But anyway, that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good night. Whoa, 47 minutes. Damn.